You know how sometimes talented modders will take a game and build a completely new game within it with totally different mechanics? Things like putting a battle royale in Minecraft, putting a Mario Kart level in Halo, or even putting Assassin's Creed in Gmod. These are amazing efforts that are able to exist independently from the original product, but we go into them with the understanding that we are playing a game that is twisting and reforming mechanics to mimic an experience they weren't built for. That is how I felt playing Assassin's Creed Mirage, Ubisoft's self-proclaimed return to form for the AC franchise. Now that isn't to say I dislike the game, because to the contrary, the 25 hours I spent with it kept me engaged from beginning to end. But whether or not I was having a good time myself, almost every aspect of it just felt a bit off. Cinematic moments are watered down by stiff animations and wooden dialogue, parkour opportunities are massively expanded but without the technical depth to match, the combat feels like a poor mimicry of the counter-focused games of the PS3 era, and the stealth... well, the stealth is quite good, I think it works well here. Now I've made it clear that AC Valhalla is my least favorite game in the series, and I think Mirage legitimately does a lot to address criticisms of that game. But while the game only spent the first few weeks of its development as a Valhalla DLC, the influence of Mirage's predecessor is apparent from the moment you first try to move Bassam around and realize he shares half his animations with Eivor. The issue here is that Mirage desperately wants to be as different from Valhalla as possible. It is so laser-focused on being more like the old games, and yet it attempts to emulate that traditional experience off the bones of a game that is, in many ways, entirely dissonant with the old design philosophies. That leaves us with a game that feels less like a return to form for Assassin's Creed, and more like an imitation of it. In my review of AC Valhalla, I had this to say. Stealth is where I want to start off, specifically because the stealth here is, in my opinion, the worst stealth system in the entire franchise. Well, we've come out the other side of that tunnel, and I'm happy to say that the reason I'm starting with stealth in Mirage is because it is legitimately one of the best stealth experiences in this series. In my other videos, I've talked about how many AC games will masquerade as stealth titles, when in reality they have just as much focus on stylish combat and explosive set pieces as sneaking around. AC Mirage, like Unity and Syndicate before it, breaks that mold, and it is a stealth game through and through. The biggest factor that makes this experience so much better than a game like Valhalla is that it actually works. The detection system feels fair, and tools like the smoke bomb and noisemaker function as intended. Now that may sound like the bare minimum, which it is, but the other two games I've reviewed in full in this series are Valhalla and Unity, so it is a relief to talk about a stealth system that is actually functional. Level design is pretty fun, giving us a bit more variety than the endless camps of Valhalla. The interiors aren't as expansive as Unity or Syndicate, but the libraries and palaces are much more fleshed out indoor areas than anything we've seen in the last three games. The addition of marksmen that need to be incapacitated before you can use your eagle to scout an area was a nice added challenge that, unfortunately, ended up being the only real surprise this stealth system had for me. As the game progresses, your enemies stay pretty much the same as they are in the first hour. Guard placement and tactics get no more difficult in the endgame when compared to the beginning. The game is also a bit too lenient on detection. Guards have almost no ability to look up, and sometimes you will finish a full-on brawl only to realize that an enemy within eyeshot missed the entire conflict. The enemy's ability to perceive you is actively worse than the Ezio trilogy, and I missed some of the AI improvements made to the last few games. Guards had full-on schedules in AC Origins and Odyssey, and there were benefits to attacking at night when guards went to bed, or putting a body where another guard might see it so they might be preoccupied by taking it away. Mirage has none of this, and the stealth loses some depth for it. But while your enemies are less impressive than past games, you yourself are kitted out with better tools than ever for sneaking and stabbing. Not only do you have your standard smoke bomb, throwing knives, tripwire, blow dart, and noisemaker, but each of these has three tiers worth of upgrades that you can mix and match to change your playstyle. Taking smoke bombs, for example, you could upgrade them so that they go off silently and make guards who feel their effects forget they saw you, both great options for a player who doesn't want any bloodshed. Alternatively, you can use a healing bomb with a flammable upgrade to keep your health topped off in combat, while also serving as a weapon in the right circumstances. This is probably my favorite tool set in any AC game, and while I would have liked more quickshot opportunities for faster and more fluid use of these tools, I had a great time with them overall. However, not even stealth in this game is free from feeling like it is focused on imitation over innovation, and that comes into play with the social stealth. 
Systemic blending is back, meaning you can blend so long as three or more NPCs are grouped together, which is great. However, the mechanic is really just there, only utilized on rare occasions for certain missions and otherwise very easy to ignore. This isn't a new problem for Ubisoft at all. After AC1 introduced the idea of being a blade in the crowd, the series has seemingly been very confused as to how to implement this beyond making crowds mobile hiding spots. In 2009, it felt like a cool idea that needed to be fleshed out, and in 2015, it was a cool but kind of stale idea that needed to be fleshed out. So now in 2023, it's back with few to no improvements over the iteration we had a decade and a half ago. You combine that with the mercenaries and musicians that call back to the distraction opportunities from AC2, and you end up with a system that parrots the Ezio trilogy without really doing anything to address the stagnation that caused social stealth to disappear in the first place. Ubisoft also struggled to figure out how to integrate this mechanic into the open world, because outside of these missions where social stealth is actually viable, it is hard to find opportunities to utilize it. Running around Baghdad, it is rare to find a group of three or more NPCs close enough to an enemy for them to have any effect. This trophy here, where you have to kill ten guards while blending in a crowd, is one of the rarest trophies in the game. Ten is not a big number, and yet despite these social blending mechanics, I didn't even get half these kills naturally before I beat the game. Poorly utilized social stealth is nothing new to this series, but Ubisoft seemed to be banking on the idea that our nostalgia over having them back at all would let us gloss over this lack of innovation. However, even in this somewhat dull state, the social stealth still adds flavor to the overall system, which does get to shine in the game's black box missions. Now, these are not Hitman-level affairs. Within the game's five primary assassinations, the enemy will always be in the same place, and you will always have to perform the same tasks to expose them, with only a couple variations in how you can play. But that said, these are easily more fun than a majority of the assassinations pre-Unity and post-Syndicate. The areas they take place in range from a bustling bazaar to a locked-down garrison, with a nice mix of methodical investigation and crouch-and-cover assassination. A tip that I have personally is to save before each of these encounters. The game doesn't have a replay option, but you can have multiple saves, and so I had a lot of fun going back to these assassination missions even with those limited potential routes. This game really should have a replay option though, because since these black box missions can be accessed in any order, saving your game leaves you stuck with whatever upgrades and tools you had when you reached that mission the first time. Being able to go through the very first assassination with the tools I ended up with would have been great, but I just can't do that. There were some moments where I felt like more playstyles just should have been catered to as well. For example, in the very first assassination mission, you're given access to two potential methods of getting the target to come out of their locked room. But when I tried to walk up to that locked door, it said that I needed a key to get in. So on my second playthrough, I decided I would try to skip these opportunities and just kill everyone in the area. But unfortunately, no matter what I did, I found no way to get a key to the room, even when every enemy within a 10 mile radius was dead on the ground. So I had to follow those two opportunities in order to get to the target no matter what. Weirdly enough, a later mission allowed me to skip the stealth options and kill my target in a bloody rage, while the bizarre mission that was showcased before the game came out only had a single linear way of getting the kill. It feels uneven, and would have been nice if all of them gave the same amount of room to experiment. Overall, the stealth was my favorite part of this game. It is very competently made with a wide range of tools and environmental options to keep it feeling fresh. The AI is a regression over some previous games, and the social stealth is underused. But this is the component of Assassin's Creed Mirage that does the best job of pushing the series in a positive direction. A big part of this is that the stealth actually tries to add to and improve existing systems to bring them up to a modern standard, not just imitate them to relive the past. This is not something we see in other aspects of this game. Parkour was the component of AC Mirage that people were probably the most mixed about prior to release. In some circles, the simplified parkour of Origins through Valhalla is this franchise's biggest sin, and there are people who have been waiting almost a decade for these systems to bring back a higher level of depth. Mirage isn't the game to do that. It never looked like it was going to be, but even still it is understandable that people would have been hopeful. Instead, Bassin plays mostly the same as Eivor. He has the same slow motion startup to his walking animation, the same sprint that is only marginally faster than his jog, and the same general limitations in movement that Eivor had. Bassim feels more like Eivor than Eivor felt like Cassandra, but that's not to say it is a one-to-one -one copy and paste. 
Basim is notably faster and does have some parkour inputs that Eivor does not. He looks way better in motion than Eivor ever did, but it is still Eivor's system. The lack of momentum is one of my biggest problems here. Basim feels magnetically attracted to each foothold in front of him, making chunks of the parkour just look kind of ugly because he'll lightly touch down on a beam and then immediately glide to the next one without any sense of power behind his jump. In addition to that, he shares the stop-and-start joltiness of Eivor, something even Bayek and Cassandra didn't have. Doing anything other than running straight can cause Basim to exit sprint and reorient himself. Jumping, vaulting over an obstacle, turning too sharply, all of these things cause Basim to slow down to a jog for a second before sprinting again. It's harder to feel a sense of speed as this character than it should be. This isn't just a problem in parkour. Every assassination sees the camera zoom in and Basim takes a second to savor the moment before finally stabbing the poor guy in front of him. The weird thing with stealth kills is that he does have some new animations that are faster and give you a sense of forward momentum but he still retains several of Eivor's animations as well that will just stop him in his tracks. This is another example of the game feeling hamstrung by building off Valhalla, because the animations taken from that game are the ones that feel the most sluggish. However, despite all these complaints, parkour is far and away better than the last three games, and this is less due to Basim's own abilities and more to the world design of Baghdad itself. The team was not lying when they said the world would be more reminiscent of the Ezio trilogy. It is full of clear parkour starters, and for the first time in years, you can easily cross the city without touching the ground and without spending 90% of your time balancing on ropes. At any given moment, you have multiple directions that you can go to extend your parkour chain. They honestly did a great job here. I do not want this point to be lost among all my criticisms. Building a dense, interconnected city like this is no small task, especially when the series hasn't fully delivered on that front in eight years. Baghdad is an awesome city to traverse, and this is one category where I think that not deviating much from what the older games did design-wise is perfectly fine. Again though, it makes me wish Basim was better equipped for it. I am not one of those people who wants Ubisoft to paste in Unity's traversal system, as evidenced by my hour and a half long video criticizing that game. But the ability to eject to the side or smoothly descend to platforms below me weren't things that were that necessary in Memphis or Athens, but would have fit perfectly in this intricately designed world. The parkour also suffers from some jank that even the last few games didn't have. For example, every game has different options for downward descents. If you want to drop straight down in the original games, you could hold high profile without pressing jump. In the Kenway Saga, you could hold high profile and tap circle, and Unity and Syndicate obviously had their own fleshed out parkour down mechanics. Even the last three games had a simple version of this, where if you were approximately one story above a platform, you could push the stick toward it and your character would smoothly drop down. In Mirage, I attempted to do this, but it felt very limited. Despite being built on the bones of Valhalla, it felt like Basim would freeze at drops that even Bayek would have handled with ease. I thought Mirage legitimately had worse downward descent options than any other game in the series, until I discovered that Basim actually does have more intentional descent functionality than the last three games had. While holding circle when you reach a ledge lets you climb down, as in every other AC game, if you disengage sprint and hold circle before you reach a flat ledge, Basim gains a sort of limited parkour down functionality, kind of like AC Unity. Now this is by no means the same type of mechanic as that game, and the only things I was able to do with it were increase my maximum drop height, which was helpful, and jump over parkour starters, which feels less so. A lot of people don't care about stuff like this, but I was really happy to find a way to descend more consistently without having to climb down. At the same time, I was baffled that it works this way. If you hold circle in Origins through Valhalla, you will initiate a hang, even if the platform below you can otherwise be dropped down to when tilting the stick. That means they actively change the function of the circle button in Mirage to be more like parkour down in Unity, only to have it do very little and be very finicky to perform. Most people intuitively descend by pressing circle while sprinting when they hit the ledge, but if you do this in Mirage, Basim will hang. If you are sprinting and hold circle before you reach the ledge, you will do a slide and be crouched when you land. If you are not on a flat surface and are balanced on anything, again Basim will go into a hang. Again, it's a small thing, but another example of this weird in-between, where the game takes small steps toward being more traditional that ultimately really don't have a lot of positive impact. Now, a lot of this is actually improved by remapping your controls, and I did this for a while. I held the trigger to sprint like the old days, and moving between parkour up and down was much smoother. 
But even as more and more people came out saying that they did the same thing and that it made their experience better, I ended up changing it back. It just didn't feel right. I would be in sprint, but Bassin would spend half his time slowly jogging anyway since so many things slow him down. I was constantly reminded of his shortcomings in traversal because he's just not built the same as Ezio or Edward. I found myself frustrated trying to pretend like Mirage could play like those old games, when in reality it is its own thing. Now again, none of this is to say that I hated the traversal experience, because quirks aside, I think a lot of people will be totally content with the improved city design and faster animations. It really is amazing how much they improved over Valhalla. But again, it felt almost like driving a warthog through a Mario Kart level. Fun and nostalgic, but ultimately the result of a player character being put somewhere they just aren't built for. Combat is the aspect of Mirage that suffers the most from this identity crisis that comes from using Valhalla's mechanics to call back to the older games. This is, at its core, a stripped-down version of the combat in Valhalla. You still have these over-exaggerated swings, red unblockables and yellow parryable attacks to look out for, and the same dodge and stamina drain systems. However, the way that combat plays out feels entirely different from its predecessor. First off, Bassem can only take a few hits, even on normal, so combat is quickly discouraged. There's even a tooltip saying that Bassem isn't a seasoned fighter, so you should avoid active conflict. This is true, and it does the job of pushing you towards stealth. More than a few guards can be overwhelming in the early game, so using the tools at your disposal to escape or just not get caught in the first place is the better move. This is a good thing. A lot of AC games suffer from overly easy combat, giving you minimal reason to sneak around, and so I was happy to see some challenge. That being said, even if combat exists to push you towards stealth, I still think we can expect a level of quality that Mirage doesn't reach. Enemies may not be spongy like previous games, but even if their health bars say otherwise, every hit feels like slapping a rock with a pigeon feather. Enemies barely notice your swings, and the weakest of grunts can get sliced multiple times in a row without ever acknowledging you. This exists because the team wanted to challenge you by making enemies difficult to stagger, and while that works, it also makes the combat look so low impact and ugly. When bigger guards come around that can't be attacked from the front, your sword just bounces off of them like you're hitting a metal wall, and their animations aren't phased. I get what they were going for, which is to be more parry and animation focused like the old games. On normal, regular enemies die after one successful parry, so you spend a lot of your time on defense, waiting for your moment to open up for an instant kill. But that system isn't exactly fun. The allure of the Ezio combat was how good it looked, with paired animations making the experience feel cinematic from beginning to end, even if it wasn't that mechanically engaging. Without that visual flair, and without the expansive ability and weapon variation of the last three games, Mirage ends up being the worst of both worlds uncinematic like Valhalla, and overly simple like the Ezio trilogy. You only have one weapon, the sword and dagger combo, which isn't a bad thing, and unlike Valhalla you get plenty of animations for it, which makes it a much more cinematic experience on average. But as the game progresses and you improve, your enemies stay stagnant. You realize that the parry window is actually quite large, and the iframes you get from a dodge make red attacks negligible. That's not to say that the system is too easy, or that difficulty is even a must in these games, but I really do think it's overly simple in this one. You really don't have to learn your enemy's moves regardless of archetype beyond identifying what color the attack is, meaning that even when you are surrounded by a dozen guards, you're still just waiting to either press square or press circle. I think playing hard is the best way to play because you get pushed into stealth more clearly, as was seemingly the intent, but even then, this does exacerbate the flaws of this combat system, because it doesn't really get harder so much as it just takes longer. For example, on hard, enemies don't die in one parry, but this exposes the fact that hitting them can then feel useless, since the next parry is probably what's going to kill them anyways, so it's usually more efficient to just wait for them to attack. Likewise, these elite guards will pursue you when your notoriety is maxed out, and on normal you can focus on their health bar or their stagger bar. But on hard mode, it's tough to get their health bar down before they heal, so waiting for parry opportunities is really your only option. This means that on pretty much every difficulty, your best bet is to stand around and wait for enemies to attack, which was probably the worst part of the combat in AC2. All of this is just describing what combat is like on its own. Again, pulling out sleep darts or the smoke bombs trivializes this system quite a bit, but I wanted to note just how simplistic it all is compared to the past games at that core level. 
I honestly enjoyed figuring this system out, and I am glad it's more focused than Valhalla, but it just isn't very fun, and it doesn't progress at all past the beginning of the game. It's such a bare-bones combat system that it feels like its identity ends at being there to push you toward the much more fleshed-out stealth mechanics. As I was playing, I realized it wasn't AC2, or even AC Valhalla that this game was reminding me of. To me, it felt like Dishonored. Simple combat where you hold your sword up at the right time and a cool animation plays. But the thing is, Dishonored is a first-person game. It doesn't need to look good, because you only see right in front of you, and even then you can only see your own arms. AC Mirage is attempting to stretch a system based around hacking at a health bar into a cinematic animation-based system, but Basim limply lifting his parrying dagger so a cool animation can start is neither stylish nor especially fun to play. I think a lot of that stems from Ubisoft trying to dig a traditional experience out of the mechanics of Valhalla, when in reality, the two just don't mix. The one component that never misses in Assassin's Creed is the settings, and Baghdad carries on that legacy well. While the boxy architecture is reminiscent of the Holy Land cities of AC1, this version of Baghdad is ultimately very distinct from the other games in this series. Given that the Round City no longer exists, this is another example of Ubisoft using historical records and their own artistic license to build this game world from scratch. The result is a beautiful recreation of one of the greatest cultural hubs of the 9th century, with this franchise's usual painstaking attention to detail intact. This game has the best version of these dumb, floating Animus ball collectibles, because this time they actually serve the purpose of giving you extra information for your codex about these historical sites. The codex educates you on everything from a broad explanation of how a caliphate works, all the way down to the details of the city's postal system. As with any AC game, it's best to use the game as a starting point to do research of your own if you actually want to know more about this setting, but after the fantastical outfits and exaggerated Roman ruins of AC Valhalla, I was happy to explore a more grounded locale. Educational value aside, Baghdad is just gorgeous. Large landmarks like the House of Wisdom and the Central Palace give Baghdad a sense of scale we haven't seen since London and AC Syndicate. Little things like the exaggerated size of the sun to make the skyline look like a painting, or the varied bits of environmental dialogue you can hear from merchants as you walk down the streets, all give the city an atmosphere that sits with the franchise's best. Many settings in this series fall victim to being too derivative of previous games through overuse of existing assets, but this is one category where Mirage is entirely itself. Less impressive is the fact that the side content does very little to enhance this setting. I have talked about the ways in which gameplay can play a role in making a setting better through the use of relevant and fun content. Games like AC4, Syndicate, and Origins excel in this. Unfortunately, there isn't much content in Mirage that takes advantage of its unique setting. It mostly revolves around picking up collectibles or doing side contracts that could have existed in any of the other games. Even the Tales of Baghdad, which are holdovers of the style of narrative missions that existed in Valhalla, just act as small, forgettable stories that are over as fast as they start. The game just doesn't incentivize you to explore, especially outside the city, where there really isn't anything of note beyond some points of interest that you're already going to access in the main story anyways. It is dull and empty, more reminiscent of the somewhat boring Kingdom map of AC1 than the more engaging and dynamic deserts of AC Origins. The city also lacks visual diversity, which is understandable since many of the single city AC games have this issue, but the different districts of Baghdad were marketed as being substantially distinct in the pre-release interviews. This is the exact same type of marketing that AC Revelations got back in 2011, and it's a shame to be disappointed in the exact same way in 2023. Now, one of my least favorite parts of Assassin's Creed Valhalla was its arc system, where you would go to different regions in any order and complete their individual stories. Because each region would have its own list of side content to complete within it, Valhalla's world began feeling like a giant checklist. And unfortunately, Mirage sticks very close to that formula, with its four major districts of Baghdad essentially serving the same purpose as the individual arcs in Valhalla. The aspect of Mirage that suffers most from this is, in my opinion, the story. Because a majority of the narrative beats in this game can be accessed in any order, the narrative has very little room to impress. Characters and relationships are only really allowed to grow in the intro and conclusion of the story to accommodate this structure. While I already didn't like this system in Valhalla, this becomes much more apparent in a 20-hour game compared with a 200-hour game. Now is a good time to actually talk about what we're looking at narratively. Now this isn't my 30-minute Unity rant about why the writing in that game was nonsensical. 
I do not have that much to say about the story here, which is why it doesn't even get its own section in the video. While I have heard some people say that they think Mirage has the worst writing in the series, I personally do disagree. Not really to give this game any more credit, but instead because there is some pretty offensively bad storytelling in this series, and I don't think Mirage sinks to those lows. But I do think Mirage is the most nothing story we have in this series. It's the least ambitious, and I doubt I'm going to remember it a month from now. Basim is your typical hero fighting against bad guys with nothing to set him apart from the mold until the final 10 minutes of the game. He gets a couple standout moments, with one especially fun scene where he has to disguise himself to enter a harem that brings some more personality out of the character, but a lot of that just serves to contrast just how little he gets to shine outside of these scenes. The dialogue is never interesting, and the voice direction feels like they just recorded the actor's first read-throughs and called it a day. Lee Majdub and Shorag Dashlu are wasted, getting very few scenes to show off their acting skills between a slew of dull, expositional voice lines that just tell you where to go next in the game. There is so much they could have done with Basim after the way Valhalla concluded. He is such an interesting character to explore, but even if he continues to be featured heavily in future games, I think his origin story here is very skippable. I can't imagine the finale to this game will have any real emotional impact if you didn't play Valhalla, and perhaps not even then. The villains of this game also suffer from this piecemeal structure. Back in Origins, Ubisoft started making the villains masked baddies who we do not expose until right before we kill them. This adds some mystery, sure, but it also means that each target is a narrative non-entity until about a minute before they die. None of the villains in this game leave a mark because the game tells you they're evil and gives you these little post-it notes around the world telling you that they're evil, but you don't actually see them do anything other than bleed out on the ground. Something Mirage does succeed in is pivoting focus to the assassins, or the hidden ones in this game. Let it be known, this is the most focus the Brotherhood has gotten since AC1, and there is some cool stuff here. It gives us little bits of lore, like master assassins wearing red and having larger beaks on their hoods than initiates, which are all really cool dressing that we so rarely get in these games. I made a video talking about how Assassin's Creed games so often ignore the assassins and their creed, so playing as a member of the Brotherhood making their way up the ranks is great to see. But a lot of that stuff does lose its impact when I just don't care about any of the assassins I meet. As nice as it is to be wearing the robes, the philosophical conflict and the engaging dialogue of AC1 is nowhere to be seen. Becoming a master assassin within a couple in-game months feels more like leveling up a gamified rank than any kind of narrative growth on Basim's end. So yeah, many people are going to be happy that the devs listened and made a game focused on the assassins, but I don't think that forgives the fact that they didn't prioritize making a good story in general. Of all the things you can blame on budget, Boring writing is boring no matter how much money went into it. Again, the world that Mirage builds here is fantastic, but while some games in this series go above and beyond to immerse you in their worlds through an engaging story and side content, Mirage is content to be a pretty face that calls back to the old games in terms of iconography, but not in character or narrative quality. Every aspect of this game feels, to one extent or another, like it's trying to be something it's not. Ubisoft Bordeaux had a clear vision for a very traditional Assassin's Creed game, but the tools and budget they were given forced them to try and morph Valhalla into that game, which was always going to be a losing battle. And I think this smaller team did a commendable job, I really do. The parkour and this combat system do a lot of work to feel more like the older games, whether or not I think they have flaws but the team was never aiming to make the best Assassin's Creed they could. They were trying to make the best Assassin's Creed that Valhalla could hope to be, and that bar is a lot less interesting in my opinion. I get that for plenty of people the principle matters a lot. A smaller team working on an AC game they have been asking for since 2015 is exactly what we have here. There is an extent to which its quality can take a backseat to the fact that Ubisoft was willing to make this game at all. A lot of the people who watch my channel are Assassin's Creed fans, and to people who miss the Ezio days, I totally recommend this game. Not just based on nostalgia, but because this game has legitimately fun mechanics that I think a lot of people have really been missing. I don't want to come across like I'm saying that this quote-unquote return to the roots doesn't mean anything, because it totally does. Look online at how many AC fans genuinely love this game and are praising the heck out of it. No matter what criticisms I pose here, I do not mean to diminish the impact this game has had for those people. But at a personal level, I am more interested in reviewing this game for what it is, rather than what it represents to me. 
One way that helped me gauge that was by posing a hypothetical question to myself. Would I have liked this game if it came out in 2010? If this were the third game in the series, if Ubisoft never milked the Ezio trilogy, if we never expanded into sailing pirate ships, if we never added RPG mechanics to revive the franchise, if all we had were AC1 and AC2, how would I have felt about AC Mirage? Well, obviously the graphics would have blown me away, but outside of that, even with the understanding that this is a smaller game that isn't meant to be judged with the bigger titles, I genuinely do not believe AC Mirage would have been received as well if it came out for the PS3 13 years ago, and even now in 2023 the response has been lukewarm. I would have been disappointed by the ugly cutscenes with less impressive facial animations than AC2. I would have been disappointed by the pared down parkour that would have felt like a big step back in terms of animations and player control. I would have been disappointed by the ugly combat and boring story. And if I would have been disappointed by this game 13 years ago as a PS3 title, then maybe it's my standards that have dropped to meet this game where it is, instead of this game rising on its own merit. That is why I can recommend this game to those hardcore old school fans, but only to those hardcore old school fans. Because when you look at this game as it is, not just as a response to previous games, I honestly don't think there is a lot of value here for people outside of this niche group. I stated earlier, AC Valhalla is my least favorite game in the series, but to be honest, I can recommend it to more people than I can AC Mirage. The newer Assassin's Creed games may not have been everyone's cup of tea, but each game makes sacrifices in some areas so that they can shift their focus to others. AC2 did indeed have pretty brain-dead combat, but a lot of people were okay with it because it looked so good. On the opposite end of that spectrum, Odyssey's combat is comparatively pretty ugly, but that style was sacrificed to heavily increase mechanical depth in its system. For some fans this works, and for others it doesn't. But the point is that style wasn't erased just because Ubisoft got lazy, but instead because it was sacrificed to improve other things. But then you look at Mirage, and you see that its combat is pretty brain dead while also being really ugly, and there's no sacrifice there. There's nothing we get in return for the losses, no reasoning that justifies the problems, it's just worse than the last games. Sure, mocap cinematics are nice, but some people like player choice and dialogue options. But take both away and you're just left with ugly cutscenes, nothing more. Maybe a segmented form of storytelling works better for a 100 hour game, but put that into a 20 hour experience and you end up with a game that is unfocused and brief in equal measure. The underutilization of social stealth has been a criticism since 2009. The inaccurate marketing of more visually diverse cities is the same criticism I had in 2011. The lack of narrative presence for the villains was a problem I had since 2017. Going back to this series' roots did not have to entail running through a lot of the problems that this series has, in certain parts of its lifespan, already solved in different ways. Alright. As harsh as I have been, I will reiterate that I had fun with this game. After my negative reviews of Valhalla and Unity, I was hoping my next big AC video would be something more positive. And really, this game isn't nearly as bad as those in terms of my own personal opinion. I honestly have those in my F tier if I were to make an imaginary tier list, while Mirage is probably somewhere in the C realm. But while I totally respect why some people would be more than content with this game, because it does have solid stealth mechanics, a beautiful world, a tight focus, and that adherence to tradition, it just didn't evoke the same emotions for me. This is a good game for being built off Valhalla. It's a good game for being made by a smaller team. It's a good game for being on a limited budget. But while I can acknowledge that, I also think it's more than fair to look past those caveats and look at the product for what it is. Without these justifications, I don't think AC Mirage hits the mark. I see the appeal of a budget game built for the sake of older fans, and I'm glad it exists. But while I hope Ubisoft's next effort sees the positive reception toward the idea of this game and takes that into account, I also hope that the next entry is focused more on being a good game than just imitating a good game. That's all I have. Sorry for another more negative video again. I'm going to try to make something more positive next because it really is more fun to talk about things that work well. Let me know what you think of AC Mirage in the comments. I am a small channel, so I'm always happy to talk with people as long as you're respectful. And if you do want to support me further, my Patreon is in the description. But otherwise, please do take care of yourself and have a great day.